Among many late war man Nazi designs, there is this one that was probably the craziest. It was not just then a state-of-the-art jet bomber, but one with forward-swept wings that could outrun any Allied fighter and was so good that it secured an order of 500 of them to save Hitler's Third Reich. Let's explore the story behind the Junkers bomber that had one of the most interesting legacies in the history of aviation and answer the question, what if? The issue that plagued most German bombers during World War II is that their counterparts were simply much better in payload capacity. The heaviest German bombers of World War II, the Hunkel 177 Greif, was behind both the Avro Lancaster and the B-29, with its maximum payload being around 7,000 kilograms. By comparison, the Lancaster had 10,000 kilos and the B-29 with a whopping 12,000 kilograms, respectively. A far cry from the idea that every Nazi aircraft was better in every way. But by pioneering jet engine technology in the late stages of the war, it opened the door to a whole new bunch of crazy and very fast aircraft. But no idea was more exciting to the Nazis than that of the perfect bomber. One that would be able to deliver massive amount of ordnance, outrun and outmaneuver allied fighters, and it produced in large enough numbers, maybe stop the enemy advance on one front and allow the Germans to focus on the other and perhaps even turn the tide of war. An impossible mission for the engineers, one might say, but there was this one trick up their sleeves, and it had to do with inverting the wings. Now I bet you're watching this and wondering, what would it be like to fly? War Thunder. Don't fast forward on that timeline, because I'm inviting you to come and play with me and fly some of the craziest aircraft ever built in War Thunder, a free online military vehicle combat game. War Thunder features over 2,000 different land, sea and air machines from 1920s to the Cold War that you can fly, drive and cruise to challenge yourself to be better than the aces of the past. My favourite so far being the P400. And there are updates every few months with more content like one that just featured the F-14 Tomcat. You can play solo missions, or my favourite, in huge air battles with over 100 different maps. That's right, huge battles that we can all play together. We played a few months ago and it was the most chaos I've ever seen in a match and I can't wait to do it again. I'm still very much a beginner in the game, so you have a great chance to save me from other players. Or if you really want, shoot me down, like everyone else did last time. When you make an account with my link, you'll get a free bonus premium tank, aircraft and ship, as well as a boost to your account. The game's free to play across all platforms, PC, PlayStation and Xbox, and you can cross-play with anybody on any other device, so you don't need anything. A keyboard and a mouse on the basic PC will run it. So no excuse to not make an account with my link, do the tutorial, and come and play with me next time. It's going to be an absolute blast, I know. I'll add the details of how to find each other in the description down below. Forward swept wing design is an interesting concept, dating even before the start of World War II with the Soviet Belyaev DBLK. Around the same time, a German airplane designer called Hans Wocke was also working on the same concept, studying the regular swept wing design issue with early jet engines, namely how they did not provide enough lift at subsonic speeds. Forward swept wings would allow for extra lift during takeoff off with these early jet engines help greatly with the maneuverability of the aircraft, increase the maximum speed due to lower drag, and allow for a larger payload capacity. The perfect solution, right? Well, it's not that easy. Although correct, there was one critical issue that the Germans kept coming up to with this wing design. During any maneuvers, extreme stress would be applied on the outer area of the wings and warp them in the opposite direction a maneuver such as a dogfight. Materials such as aluminium, or aluminium for my North American friends, was one of the most advanced materials in use during that time, but it still couldn't handle this amount of stress. Meaning, forward swept wings would never work with a fighter, but they might just work with a bomber. Now, the biggest advantage that they would get with this type of wing design is a huge single bomb bay, and it could be located in the perfect spot in the fuselage. 
the center of gravity. This was thanks to the root of the wing spar being further back compared to the normal wing design. So in 1944, the first prototype was completed, and to say that it was a Frankenstein plane would be an understatement. This project as a whole, although prospective, was just an aerodynamical testbed at the time of development, which leads to its Frankenplane point. The first U-287V1 was made out of, well, other planes. The fuselage was donated by the He-177, the tail section from the U-188, the main landing gear from the U-352, and here comes the best part, the front landing gear section was from a shot down B-24 Liberator. Talk about using your enemy's tools against them. The engines for this prototype were the UMO-004, the same one used in the Mi-262. Two of them in nacelles under the wings and another two in the front section of the fuselage. The landing gear was not retractable and this would make it the only jet bomber in the world with such a feature. However, cover would be added around the wheels to eliminate extra drag, a similar solution to what was done on the famous Stuka. In August of 1944, flight testing started and the results were very promising but the design was just about to receive some major upgrades. After experiencing the aforementioned issues with the wing warping, the Germans found a workaround with moving all of the engines under the wings and slightly forward, making a balance mass big enough to eliminate some of the stress on the wing construction. The U-287V2 would receive two clusters of three engines on the wings. It was a combination of the UMO-004 and BMW-003. These engines were actually used on the He-162 fighters in the late war, so let me know if you like a video on that as well. Apart from these changes, the second prototype also had a pressurized cockpit from the U-288 and a completely new tail section. The design ticked pretty much all of the requirements and the only thing they still needed were the brand new engines to give this jet some real power. Oh, did I mention that they were going for almost a supersonic speed? The idea was to outrun any allied fighters at the time and a top speed that they were looking for was around 850 kilometers per hour, which these new engines would provide in spades. Although they never actually got them in time, obviously, a top speed of still 660 kilometers was achieved during testing of this bomber, which is more than any allied counterpart could do. The third, fourth, and fifth prototype were built, but the development was suddenly brought to a halt in 1944. The project sat idle for some time, although Junkers was allowed to continue testing the V1 prototype until around the beginning of 1945. But in March of the same year, they suddenly received an order for 500 planes with a planned production of 100 per month out of nowhere. Now, put yourself in Junkers' shoes. It's been nearly a year since you seriously worked on this concept and the order from the bunker was alarming at best. Was this some type of joke or a serious plan? Unfortunately, we'll never know. But only a month later, the Soviets would capture the production facilities in Dassault and along with them, the whole team developing the aircraft. And you know that this wasn't the end of the story. The V1 and V2 prototypes were destroyed to prevent capture as the Soviets advanced, but the V3 and V4, the ones intended as serial production aircraft, were captured and transferred to the Soviet Union. Having all of the engineers, documentation and prototypes, the Soviets started developing their own forward-swept wing bomber called the EF-131. A larger EF-140 bomber soon followed with only two engines, because jet development was going very fast, pun intended, and there was no need for multiple engines anymore. However, the project was stopped in 1950s with the team shifted to more contemporary jet projects. The legacy of this design still goes on though in both Germany, Russia and the US. The German concept was led by none other than Volke himself, 
who would go on to develop the only forward-swept wing commercial aircraft, the HFB-320 Hansa jet. The Americans developed the X-49 and the Soviets, and later on the Russians, developed the Su-47. We already have a video about this nutty Soviet design on the channel, so go check it out if you want to. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon on another crazy aircraft adventure.